The following presentation is brought to you by Perusia Media. Please listen at the end for more information about the many fine products available from Perusia Media. Let's say a little prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most high, glorious God, enlighten the darkness of our hearts. Give us a right faith, a firm hope, perfect charity, and profound humility with wisdom and perception, O Lord, so that we may do what is truly your holy will. Amen. Our Lady of Sorrows, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's lovely to be here again. It's been years since I've come to Guardians. And uh, in the olden days, we were downstairs in the hall downstairs and it used to be packed and crowded. And it, the, the, the life of the Maronite people has been magnificent. And I just want to say thank you to, you to you all for your faith and everyone who has good Catholic faith, not just the Maronites. But you've been so important to the faith in Sydney, especially over the last 20 or 30 years. You've done so much for the church by your magnificent faith, so thank you. So there are three questions I want to look at, which is the whole subject of our Lord's passion and death. And the question is, why did our Lord have to suffer for us? And how does that save us? And what more could he do for us? Focusing on the passion and death of our Lord is something that is at the very heart of our faith. Okay, Many people want to grow in holiness, want to, grow, want to be able to pray, want to come close to the Lord, but they don't often get very far. And one of the reasons is you can only get so far by simply saying prayers. Now, don't misunderstand me. Said prayers are very, very important and they need to be always a part of our spiritual life. But if it's only said prayers, you're not going to get very far. One of the most important aspects of being a believer in our Lord Jesus Christ and being his is to consider is to think about him personally, particularly the mystery of our salvation, which is his passion and death. Everything about our faith is centred on this. It's the very heart of our faith. So let me tell you, those who want a faith or a Christianity without the cross, you got nothing. You want an easy life, a life of glory, you're going to hell. Mark my words. Without the cross, you go nowhere. You're not following Christ. The world is full of man-made religions. Men love making up religions. Do you know why? Do you know what is the heart of man-made religion? Human pride. And it's the sin in us that is the hardest sin to eradicate from our hearts. People are very focused these days on sex. I grew up in an innocent society. I was born in 1956, which is like 100 years ago for some of you, not for all of you. You know, there was no public sex when I was a kid. It was not even mentioned on television. You saw a couple, they weren't even in the same bed, a married couple. You know, the biggest thing you could ever see them do is give each other a little hug or a peck. We weren't focused on sex in the olden days. Now we're so oversexed, that's all people think about. And I'm very pleased that no one's having sex here at the moment. It's a relief. Because the reality is, it's not as big a deal as we're brainwashed to believe. This is the problem. We're so focused on it because we're constantly brainwashed by the media, advertising, movies, shows, internet, everything. 
the, 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 the wiring of our brains gone screw if. And that's why people are very messed up and are not finding peace and happiness in their lives and not understanding the commands of God or the teachings of Christ. And that's why it's so hard to find love. Because nobody knows what love is anymore, hardly. You want to know what love is? The passion and death of Christ. And if you don't run from it, if you welcome it, and you open your heart to him and to what he has done for us, then his grace transforms you. So let's dive in, because there's, I want to get a lot, and please forgive me, I, I usually don't rely on notes so much when I give talks, but this is so rich, and there's so much... I don't want to forget or pass over that I'm going to be referring to my notes a fair bit, so please forgive me. I hope it doesn't take away from what I'm trying to do here. The first thing everyone needs to understand, it is our sins that caused Jesus to be crucified. Okay, You might not think that, but it is, in fact, the fundamental truth. And it's everyone's sins not only the sin of Adam and Eve, not only the sins of those who commit murder and all the biggest sins you can imagine, but everyone's sins. All our sins, your sins, my sins, have caused Jesus to be crucified. And be very clear on this. We have a fallen nature, okay? There isn't anybody other than the Blessed Virgin Mary and perhaps St. Joseph and maybe a few very rare saints, besides our Lord, of course, who doesn't sin. Don't ever believe the crap that we hear so often that people say they're good. I'm a good person. Rubbish. What did Jesus say on that issue? No one is good but God alone. No one. We are sinful. We have a fallen nature. We are inclined to sin. It's, it's our natural go-to. To not sin, we have to work. We have to climb a mountain. We have to train ourselves. We are sinners. And you've got to understand there's more sins than sins like murder, stealing and sex. They're not the only sins we commit. And as I said, the most insidious, the most hidden sin in humanity is pride. And I personally have never met a human being in my life that doesn't suffer with that sin. Okay? It's a doozy. From Adam and Eve to the last human being on earth, we cause Jesus to be crucified. Each of us, from the moment of our conception, because we are conceived in original sin, it's not a sin of our, our own guilt. True, okay? We didn't commit original sin. Our first parents did. And by the way, I want to throw in here, anyone who thinks Adam and Eve doesn't exist or are just a myth or a story is not Catholic. It's part of the dogma of the Catholic faith. I went through the seminary in the 70s. Oh, what a mad time in the church. It was insane. And this whole liberal new idea started rising up, came from the hippie movement partly in the 60s, which I grew up through as well. And one of the things they all said was, oh, the scriptures are full of stories. It's all parables and stories. You don't have to believe it literally. That's a lie. In fact, just to confirm this, it's funny, as I've gotten older and modern science, medical science has developed, it only just proves how everything in the scriptures are true. For example, modern medical science has discovered through DNA we actually all come from one man and one woman. Adam and Eve is true. Okay? Geological science has discovered there's evidence of the flood everywhere. Noah and the story of the flood is true. South Africa, and what America did I read a few weeks ago? Head first. 
He was in a school of sardines, this huge giant whale, opened its mouth to suck in all the sardines. He was in it, boom, in he went. I think Jonah is true too. The more I've discovered what's in Scripture is truth, and we are better to accept it so that we can grow in our faith than not, believe me. Okay. The second thing to understand, as great as the mercy of the Lord is, and as freely as it is given. Now, I want to emphasize those two points. The mercy of the Lord is so great that from our perspective, it has no end. I never doubt Christ's mercy, ever. And it is given as freely as can be possibly given. The only obstacle to Christ's mercy is always us, never him. However, the cost of that mercy is something we need to consider. The cost that Christ paid is his passion and death. And that was no easy thing. Easy to say, passion and death of Christ, our salvation. But what he went through is beyond our human imagining. And by considering this regularly and meditating upon it, it helps us to be grateful. And without gratitude, there isn't love. One of the things I've always found with married couples, I like to pick on married couples, number one, because I love married couples. Without marriage, true marriage between a man and a woman, the human race is finished. It's not just about biological bringing babies into the world. But one of the, the struggles that married couples often have in their love for one another is the lack of gratitude. And that is a horrific sin of omission. See, there's another sin we commit by not being and showing gratitude. We need to be grateful to our Lord for his unbounded love. And by considering this, this will also help us grow in love. Now, we've got to start with the whole mystery of God becoming man. Okay, this is not something that you can just push aside. This is the most amazing thing imaginable. I want you to try and imagine God if you can, and just to try and help you. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere. Almighty. He has no beginning or end. He's infinite. So how can you imagine that? Can you? I can't. It's sort of like your brain's going to explode trying to think about a being that is all that. And this all-powerful, infinite being united himself with a created, tiny little being, the human being. That in itself is a humiliation for God. Now, people don't like that idea. Oh, how can becoming one of us be a humiliation? When you're God, it's an enormous humiliation. A finite created being that's so limited compared to him. The very act of the incarnation is an act of humility for God. And this is the mystery of the incarnation, God becoming a man. You and I, every human being, we have one nature, a human nature. Our Lord Jesus has two natures, an eternal nature, divine, and a human nature. And that, his conception in the womb of Our Lady, the two became one. They're not separate. They're two. That's why Mary becomes the mother of God, because the child in her womb is God. She's not just the mother of Jesus, as Protestants think. They've cut him in half, which cannot be done. 
the moment the word of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the two natures were united eternally, never to be separated again. This is what God has done in utter love for us. So the very beginning of his plan of salvation for us is him humbling himself to the depths. Throughout his whole life, from growing inside his mother's womb, from a dot, because that's how we all start as a dot, and that's why the church teaches with absolute certainty and medical science agrees, except the media won't tell you that, from the moment of conception, we are a complete human being. Don't ever doubt it. From the moment of conception, we are a complete human being with an immortal soul. Nothing is added. Everything is there in the little dot we are at the beginning of our life, including our immortal soul. The only thing that is added is nourishment, love and protection from the mother. That's why the church teaches unequivocally it is a mortal sin to have an abortion. It's cold-blooded murder, no ifs or buts. Don't ever play with this one. It's the worst murder on earth. We are killing the most innocent, indefensible human being imaginable. It cannot be justified and don't ever believe it's my body, I can do what I like with it. That's not true. It's not your body. You do not own your body. I don't own my body. Our bodies are a gift from God. And we don't have the right to do what we want with them. We have the freedom, but that never means it's okay. We have the freedom to do the most horrific things, to commit the worst sins imaginable, but that doesn't make it right. What the church teaches in these matters is the truth. It doesn't matter what people think. And this is another thing to understand because there's a lot of absolute garbage going around the church at the moment. And I don't know how much of it filters into you guys. But this idea that our opinion is valuable. What a lot of rubbish. How can you ask the opinion of people who know nothing about the faith? And how can you consider that as having value? It's nonsense. God has revealed the truth to us in his son. And our task is to learn what he's revealed, to grow into it, not to tell him what, what it is. He gave us the church. The church is his body. And what she formally teaches is the truth. And anyone who says it's okay to use contraception, it's okay to have an operation to stop yourself from having babies, it's okay to commit an abortion, it's okay to commit euthanasia, they have rejected Christ with their heart and soul and mind and body. They have rejected him and what he has revealed. And without repentance, they will go to hell for all eternity. But if they repent, because his mercy is so great, they will be forgiven. There's nothing God can't forgive except that which we will not let him forgive. Understand that very much. Our Lord, who is God and all-knowing, but also human, humbled himself. He grew up. He learned on the lap of Our Lady at the feet of St. Joseph. He did not have to do it, but he did it in utter love. He learned from Joseph how to be a carpenter. He learned everything from Mary and Joseph. And he submitted himself in obedience to them. Remember when he was lost in the temple, he wasn't lost, but they had lost him. And after the third day they found him and Mary said, Son, why have you done this to us? Don't you know how worried we've been? And he looked at her honestly, simply and lovingly. Do you she wasn't know? angry or upset with him. She treasured it in her heart. She knew who her son was. 
But he went home and submitted to their obedience until the time was right. He did this to teach them, to prepare them for what had to unfold, but always humbling himself. But the passion per se, when it really starts, even though he suffered, he gave himself in his public ministry, you know, constantly giving. Humanly, he was exhausted at times, constantly healing, teaching, having mercy, driving out demons. He just worked. You know, remember that scene when the apostles were trying to keep the mothers with all the children away? Leave the master alone. He's tired. And Jesus is angry with them. Stop. Let the little ones come to me. Do not stop them because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. He didn't care how tired he was. He just gave and gave and gave, no matter what the cost, throughout his three years of public ministry. But then everything was culminating to this point, and it all begins at the Last Supper, that beautiful, extraordinary supper, which is part of the Sacred Mass. Here we talk about our Lord's Eucharistic heart, a heart that is expanded and glowing with utter love. He humbly serves his brethren, he washes their feet and wipes them. But there's something heavily weighing on his heart. In fact, two things. One, of course, the passion and suffering and death he's about to undergo. But two, a betrayer. One of his own is about to betray him. Course he knew exactly who it was and he tells them and they can't stand not knowing and Peter who's the most impetuous of all knows how close the young John is to Jesus leaning on his breast in in this affection that is so magnificent and he says to John ask him who it is and Jesus tells him the one who dips in the dip with me and of course it was Judas So we've got this immense love and this pain in his heart at the same time. But then he does the most extraordinary thing. Now we're on the other side of that extraordinary thing. But the apostles show how magnificent their faith was. Because if we'd never heard of this, if we'd never imagined it, how would we have reacted? Would we have been like the many that walked away when he said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood or you'll have no life in you? He turned bread and wine into his body and blood. He gave himself perpetually till the end of the world to his disciples, to his church. This is what the Eucharist is. Christ making himself vulnerable in love till the end of time in the blessed Eucharist. When the bread and the wine are consecrated, it truly is him. You cannot see him with your eyes. You cannot taste him with your mouth. And you're not supposed to. He wants you to believe. He wants you to learn to see with the eyes of faith, with the eyes of the soul. If you need proof, that's sad. His word is enough. He is God. He said he was God. He proved who he was again and again and again. He said it. It's enough. This is my body. This is the chalice of my blood and the new and eternal covenant. A new covenant in him. What he has done in the Old Testament from the time when the people were enslaved in Egypt, in order for them to be free, he told them to get a lamb without blemish, without spot, to sacrifice it and eat it and put the blood on the doorpost. That blood will spare you from the angel of death as it goes through Egypt to kill all the firstborn firstborn boys and firstborn cattle. And it was a sign of what God intended to do. And ever since then, the Jews made this sacrifice every year. The lamb, the killing of the lamb was like, well, I can't kill myself because my sins deserve death. Now, you may not accept that, 
He may find that, how do my sins deserve death? But they do. One of the problems we all have is we don't realise what our sins actually do. We're often blind to the harm they do. But let me tell you this, and I'm, I, I'm the same, you know, it's very hard to see the, the, har- the harm our sins cause in this world. Until you look at others and see the bad they've done and what it does. I, I, as a priest, you know, I've met so many people who have suffered at the hands of their parents. So many people whose lives are utter misery, who suffer depression because they've had something's gone wrong at home, something badly wrong. Because of the sins of their parents. How many people suffer because of what someone says or does or fails to do? How many people are hurt, heartbroken, even destroyed by the greed of others, by the dishonesty of others? And the trouble is, we won't see the damage our sins have done until we die. Then we'll see it all as clear as crystal. We'll see our whole life. We'll see absolutely everything. Oh, my gosh. What a frightening moment the day of judgment is going to be. Or maybe. But he hasn't left us, you see. He hasn't abandoned us to it. He's given us the remedy. But the, the, the truth is, whether you see it or not, our sins deserve death. And what Christ has done, because he loves us so much, he's taken what we deserve on himself so that we do not have to die. The Old Testament, the Lamb was a symbol. In the New Covenant, Christ is the reality. And he said, okay, I love you so much. I want you so much to be with me in my glorious kingdom forever. I'm going to take what you deserve on myself. And that's why he had to die. If he didn't, it would still all belong to us. And part of the reason is that, of course, is the sin of our first parents. And if you read the book of Genesis, which you should, you must, you'll find out that God did not create death. He never intended anyone or anything to die. Death was the result of the sin of our first parents. They brought death into the world. And all our sins add to it. So our sins deserve death. Here he is at that supper, full of love, giving himself completely, but weighed down by what he's about to endure. And then we see it. He goes with the apostles after the supper to the Garden of Olives. We call the agony in the garden. And he takes the three closest ones to him. He leaves the others. Judas is long gone. The others are all there. And he brings the three closest ones to him, Peter, James and John. And then he goes a little way from them. And he pours out his heart in utter anguish to the Father, begging And this is his human heart, okay? This is his human nature crying out because he's a man in everything but sin and he knows exactly what's about to happen to him and his heart is aching. He's so weighed down by anguish and dread that he sweats blood. He's sweating blood. That's how distressed he is, how deeply distressed, begging his father, let this cup pass me by. But then... Not as I will, but as you will. He's bringing his human nature around to what he knows he came for. At times he would say, I long for this. I want it to happen. Like he he knew it's necessary and it had to be. And then he feels abandoned. A lot of them by his disciples. The three that were closer to him, the others. And he says, couldn't you wait one hour with me? One hour. And he goes and pours out his heart to God again. And then we're told an angel gave him comfort. 
And this time it comes back, the hour is up, and the soldiers are there with Judas. And to rub salt into the wound, it was dark, remember, there's no lights, okay? So Judas knew Jesus. That's why they needed him to point him out. But he didn't just take the soldiers to Jesus. He went up to Jesus and kissed him to make that betrayal even more painful. And Jesus looks at him and says, you betray me with a kiss. It's like a sword going through his heart. He longed to save Judas. He tried. But Judas didn't want to be saved. And this is the bottom line. We have free will. God will force no one, no one to be saved. It's our free choice. From then on, they bind him and imprison him. And he doesn't get any rest that night. They first of all drag him off to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, where the council of Jews make their case against him, which is all made up because he hasn't done a thing wrong. He is completely innocent. Then he's dragged to Pilate. Then he's dragged to Herod. Then he's dragged to Pilate again. This night seems unending for him. He endures endless false accusations. He's condemned. He's mocked. He's utterly abandoned. All the apostles ran away except for John and Peter, but then Peter denies him. And Pilate has him scourged. For what? What did he do to be scourged? Nothing. And you know a scourge wasn't a nice clean strap. On each leather strap, there were bits of bone and metal so that when they scourged him, it ripped his flesh. The pain. And that wasn't enough. You'd think that horrific scourging was enough, but the soldiers have to torment him. They blindfold him. Who hit you? Come on, prophet. They spit on him. They bash him and mock him. And then on top of everything, they fashion together a crown of thorns and they bash it into his skull. It's not just sitting there like a pretty ornament. It's bashed into his skull so that the thorns pierce his skull. Now he's dragged back to Pilate in this horrific state. And we have that famous moment that they've made paintings of where Pilate says, et your homo, behold the man. And it seems, I would say, Pilate is hoping that this horrific punishment inflicted on Jesus and the humiliation will be enough to move the people to pity. But not that rabble. Nothing is enough for them. They scream for his crucifixion. Not just his execution, but crucifixion, it's the most painful execution known to man. And they even do more than that. They curse themselves knowingly. They say, let his blood be upon us and on our children. That's how much hate has welled up within them. And I just want to add something here. Beware of the crowd. Beware of the crowd. Don't think that being with the crowd is going to put you in the right place. Nothing could be clearer than the case of His Eminence George Cardinal Pell. In case you don't know, he's 100% innocent. There's no question about it. This case against him has been an absolute disgrace. And if you read the case you'll see straight away. It's absolute nonsense. And the fact that they've found him guilty without any evidence whatsoever, without any witnesses, and the way the so-called victim portrayed the event is absolute nonsense, tells you something's very, very, very wrong. But of course, his eminence was cleaning up the Vatican Bank, wasn't he? The Mafia were using it, not that the Pope knew. The Vatican Bank's not run by the Pope. Lots of people run the Vatican Bank. And the Mafia were using it to launder money. And he was uncovering everything. 
Cardinal Pell's fearless. And they pay big money, big money for his destruction. Pray for him. The crowd is dangerous. Always. Now Judas realises what he's done. He sees what he's done to Jesus. It always astounded me how he did this. But of course, we're looking back, we can see how it unfolded. He was a greedy man, by the way. He wasn't a good man. Jesus loved him and wanted his reform and his conversion and tried everything. But he wouldn't force him. But Judas used to steal from the common fund. Okay? But now he sees what he's done. He goes back to the high priests and says, I've, I've condemned an innocent man. What I've done, I, this is wrong. And they said, get away. We don't, we don't care what you've done. We've got what we want. They try, he tries to give them back the 30 pieces of silver. They don't want it, so he throws it in the treasury. But the heartbreaking thing about Judas is instead of repenting, he despairs. And that's the problem with pride. It takes humility to repent. Pride makes you lose all hope. And I'm not talking about people who suffer depression. That's a very different thing. So don't think I'm talking about the same thing. Don't put it together, okay? That's a different sickness altogether. But he despaired and took his life instead of turning back to God. So now, on top of everything that our Lord has suffered, they make him carry his cross on that long road to Calvary. Here again, our Lord is jeered at and mocked. He falls completely exhausted and broken-hearted. And then, on the way, he meets his mother. Do you remember when you were little? Do you remember if you hurt yourself, you fell and hurt, you scraped your knees or got a splinter or did something? And you, you felt the pain and then as soon as you saw your mother, all that pain would well up in your heart and you'd burst into tears. There's something about, as a child, when you see your mother, it all, all gates, all the floodgates open. There's no holding back. Well, that's a very real thing, you know, because we have a bond with our mums because we start in them. We grow in them. We have an extraordinary bond with our mothers. And our Lord had the same bond. I mean, he's innocent and perfect. And he looks at her and sees her agony and sorrow. And she looks at him and sees his agony and sorrow. What would have gone on at that moment, we'll only find out in heaven. The pain, the grief, the heartbreak, that moment of mother and son. He goes on in all his agony and pain. He's suffering everything. He falls again. And this time, in fact, he falls twice. And this time, a passerby is forced to help him. He's reluctant. Remember, Simon of Cyrene didn't want to do this. He was just passing by, sticking his nose in to have a squeeze what's going on. And boom, they drag him in. But it changes his life entirely. Because we know from the scriptures, not only have we got his name, but we've got the names of his sons. This means they were converted and became Christians. He is comforted by that amazing woman, St. Veronica. She takes the cloth to wipe his face. She didn't care about the soldiers or about him. She just went out with courage and determination to give him some comfort. Then he meets the weeping women. And he seems to be harsh. Do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. He's telling them. The consequences of what the Jewish people have done are going to be terrible. And of course they were. Not only was it the end of the Jewish religion, the priesthood died, the Jewish sacrifice died and was never revived again. But Jerusalem was completely destroyed. Our Lord told them it would be. And that generation suffered a great deal. They killed the Son of God. And there were consequences. But he called them to do penance when he said, weep for yourselves and your children. Do penance. That's what he's saying. Turn back to God. 
Still further humiliation. They drag him on, they get to the place of the skull and they strip him. Nothing would be left for him. The last skerrick of any human dignity was his robe and his loincloth. They stripped it off him. And because it was so magnificently made, tradition has it, his mother made it, which would have been the norm anyway. It was one piece. It wasn't sewn together. It was woven as one piece. They cast lots for it. They gamble for it. For his robe. There is another tradition because they were crucified naked but, and I, I like this tradition because I can imagine Our Lady doing it. I mean, it's only my imagination and the imagination of many before me that she put her veil around his waist. And if the, the soldiers would have tried to stop them, stop her, she would have looked at them. And a look from Our Lady, I think they would have let her do it. <laughs> There's a wonderful moment in Lourdes. You know the apparition of Lourdes? And she's appearing to Bernadette. <coughs> and the demons are in the distance screaming. When she, during the apparition, get out of here, we don't want you. You know, the idiot demons, they've already lost everything. And just for a moment, Bernadette testifies, and they're screaming, making this big rabble, rabble. For a moment, Our Lady glanced in their direction, and there was instant silence. She's the queen of heaven and earth. She's very powerful. Now our Lord is nailed to the cross. So think about him. His body's covered with the horrific wounds of the scourging, the agony of the crown of thorns. He's bruised from all the falling, from the bashing, from everything he's gone through. Now they take his body and stretch it on the cross. They didn't just let him lie on the cross. They actually physically stretch it. Remember the Romans were the greatest experts in the world at crucifixion. They had it down to absolute perfection and detail. They stretched one hand. They found the little place at the base of the palm. The nail didn't go there and it didn't go there. It went there. Because there's the phalanges, I think they're called. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. A little space there where the nail could go in and lock the hand. But the trouble is there's a nerve that goes in that little space. Have you ever hit your elbow and it's gone through your whole body? We used to call it the funny bone. Do you still call it the funny bone? Yeah. And it feels horrific. Well, the nail went right through that nerve. And it's agony. And it goes through the whole body and the thumb contracts because doctors have examined all this. And of course, on the shroud, we can see that's exactly what happened. The same, then they pull the other arm out and do the same again. Then they pull the legs down, one on top of the other, and put a nail right through them. Then they hang him up. Now, the problem is when you're crucified, you're suffocating slowly. It can take days to die. Your lungs are slowly filling up with fluid. You're hanging, stretched to the max. You can't breathe. To take any breath, you have to try and lift yourself up. And every time you lift yourself up, because there's nails in your feet and the nails in your hand going through those nerves, the, the agony just rips through your body. To just take a breath. <gasps> and, and honestly, they would last for hours days like this. It was the most torturous form of death. But then our Lord does another extraordinary thing. He speaks from the cross. There's one thing I'll say it at the end, I won't say it now. There are seven words we say Christ utters from the cross, but they're not one word. Each, each word is several. And each word is so important. The first thing he says, and this is extraordinary, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive, they don't know. All as he is thinking of in his agony is saving. Saving them from hell. That's his whole desire, save them from hell. Father, forgive them. He became a man to intercede for us, to take our punishment on himself, to set us free. Father, forgive. Then there's the next most extraordinary moment. He's got two thieves, one on either side, watching everything. One of them is bitter in his suffering, but the other one isn't. 
He's watching Jesus. He sees his dignity. He sees something completely different. He sees with the eyes of faith. Faith is such a wonderful thing and it's so important. And he says an incredible thing. Lord, remember me in your kingdom. He believed him. He said, we are here because we deserve to be here. But he is innocent. Lord, remember me in your kingdom. Jesus has saved his first soul there and then on the cross. This day, he says, you will be with me in paradise. In one moment, that good thief has done all his penance, all his purgatory, everything is done. And he joins Jesus in the eternal glory of heaven. Extraordinary. Then he looks at his beautiful mother and he sees his beloved disciple John next to her. I got frustrated when I, because I was doing some research and I bumped into a, a, a Protestant site. Oh, seriously, they're so dumb, some of them. <laughs> they pretend they know about scripture. They know nothing about the sacred scriptures. You know, this dumb galoot said, oh, Jesus gave Mary to John because his brothers weren't there. Our Lord didn't have brothers as we understand it, or sisters, okay? Mary had no children. Joseph had no children. No brothers or sisters. The term in the Greek that it was written in is very, very loose. Uncles, aunties, cousins, even neighbours could be your brother or your sister in their, in their world. And the fact is that some of the ones who were supposed to be his brothers and sisters, we know who their parents were, and they certainly weren't Mary and Joseph. It's absolute nonsense. He's not looking after Mary in just the human sense. You know, I've got to make sure someone's looking after my mum. Everything he's saying from the cross is deep and rich in theology, as we call it, in meaning, in teaching. He says, woman, behold your son. My mother, I want you to take my disciples into your heart that is now pierced through. Take, it, take them into your heart, John and all of them. Take my church, be their mother. Love them, cherish them as you have done to me. Care for them, teach them, help them, intercede for them. And then he says to John, behold your mother. Take my beloved mother, whom I have loved and cherished my whole life long, whom I have respected and obeyed. Take her into your heart, obey her. Love her, cherish her. I give her to you and I give you to her. Then he cries out from the depth of his heart. His human heart is so weighed down by everything. And he feels what we feel. My God, my God. Why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? In his human nature, he feels that forsakenness that we feel. And I don't know what death is like from a personal experience other than seeing people die. But I sometimes wonder if that's how we feel when we're getting close to death. Of course, he knew he wasn't forsaken because there are two things going on here. His honest empathy with us, feeling what we feel in his human nature, but he's praying the most beautiful psalm, Psalm 22. And in that psalm, he reaches the depths of his humanity and calls out to God in utter praise, knowing that this is not the end, that this darkness is the path to eternal light. He's already in, with God in his Godhead, with the Father in his Godhead, suffering in his humanity, by opening the gates of heaven to all those whom he has laid his life down for. It's magnificent, in fact. Then he says, I thirst. This is an interesting request. Two things again. He not only is thirsty because of everything he's endured, he's suffering. Remind, he hasn't eaten for, you know, since the night before. He hasn't had anything to drink or anything to eat. He hasn't slept. 
since the Last Supper. Well he, well, he wouldn't have slept for ages before that either. But he's two things. He's thirsty for souls. He's thirsty to save. He longs to save everyone who will accept the truth in faith. But he is completing the Last Supper. The Passover meal was a sacred meal and everything had a very special place. And when in the Last Supper he didn't have the last drink of wine, he purposefully didn't have it, he's keeping it to now because he's uniting his sacrifice with the Supper and giving us the Mass. He's joining that ritualistic Supper with the sacrifice so that in the Mass from then on, when the Apostles first celebrated the Mass, they would be joined for the rest of existence of life on earth to his sacrifice. He doesn't get sacrificed again. It happened once and for all. But the Mass unites us to that sacrifice and enables us to benefit from it. And it would be nice if we only have to benefit once. But as scientists are good at telling us, our souls are changing all the time in our body. Okay, Every day we commit sins. Every day we must renew our relationship with God. That's why we need the Mass regularly. And let me tell you this, anyone who thinks it's not a sin to miss Mass on Sunday is a lunatic. Okay, if you're old or sick, okay. If it's utterly impossible to get there, okay. Visitors don't mean it's impossible. Visitors, no. We are obliged by the commandment of God to keep holy the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day for Christians is Sunday because that's the day the Lord rose from the dead. And the way we keep it holy is by doing what he gave us, which is the Mass. If you knowingly and freely miss Mass, you commit a mortal sin. And it cannot be justified. One of the things in your faith, don't justify wrong. Don't kid yourself, ever. Be humble and honest before God. Very, very important. So, because he says, I thirst, they give him the last wine, which is turned to vinegar, but it's still wine on the sponge, and he drinks that last cup. Then he says, it is finished. He has enacted the great sacrifice of love. He has given himself completely for our salvation. He has borne on himself our sin and the punishment due to us. In utter love, with complete care for us every moment of the way, no matter what the cost. And he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, and he gives up his last breath. Now, what I wanted to say a bit earlier, and I said I'll say it at the end, is this. He could have hung on that cross for as long as he wanted. Because he's also God besides being man. He didn't die because of what they did to him. He died when he chose to die. That's why they were shocked when they came to break, because of the Sabbath, they came to break the legs of the other two so that they couldn't breathe again and they'd suffocate. They came to Jesus and he was already dead because he chose to die. And that's why the soldiers stuck the lance in his heart. But several things happen at this moment. The whole world is grieving. God's creation. He's the author of life. Everything was made through him. His creation is grieving. A great eclipse takes place. There's darkness over the whole land. An earthquake takes place. There's evidence of it under the altar of Calvary today, altar of the cross. I went down there several years ago and I saw the evidence of the earthquake and they said it was probably 6.3 magnitude. A strong earthquake took place. The world is grieving and in sorrow for him. But then the remarkable thing happened. The temple, in the temple, in front of the Holy of Holies, was a great curtain which covered where the Ark of the Covenant used to be kept. It was regarded as the most sacred place in the temple. And it split. No one was allowed in there except the high priest and only once a year. And it splits from top to bottom not by human hands. Our Lord's heart is pierced and opened by a spear. The temple curtain is split and open. 
The Holy of Holies is open. The symbolism is complete. The end of the old Jewish sacrifice, the beginning of the new and eternal covenant. And no longer is God hidden from us, but is now visible in his Son, and his love is visible in his suffering and death for all generations. That's why it's so important that we consider it. He goes down to Hades in his human soul, departs from his body. He goes to that place where Adam and Eve and all the great souls were waiting for redemption and he sets them free. And then we're told in Matthew's Gospel that tombs around Jerusalem opened up and people were raised from the dead and they appeared to people throughout Jerusalem. Now we look at our question. Sinners were the authors and the ministers of all the sufferings that the divine Redeemer endured. St Francis of Assisi says, even the devils were not solely responsible for crucifying him. It was you who crucified him with them, and you continue to crucify him by taking pleasure in your vices and sins. He makes that distinction. You know, there are sins we commit in weakness. Sometimes our sin, our guilt is lessened by habit or we've got a problem, like a serious problem. But the sins we take pleasure in, the sins we choose, these are the worst. Yet still his passion and death are part of the mystery of God's plan. St Peter says, Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. And like the lamb, he was sacrificed, the lamb without blemish. Christ is the innocent lamb who took on the sins of the world and the punishment we deserve. This utter act of love sets us free from the just punishment which should be ours. He in turn asks us in his inexhaustible love to share the cross a little, to be one with him in love that we may share with him eternal glory. Jesus said, if you want to be part of me, Take up your cross every day and follow me. Without our share in the cross, we can't be one with him. This is vital. If we don't take the cross, then we don't share the glory. What he asks of us is, in fact, is little compared to what he took on. And one of the first crosses he asks of us is not doing huge, enormous penances. Is saying no to sin and yes to virtue. It's the most important cross of all. To learn self-control. To grow in virtue. One of the things I've often found again with married couples is they're so good at seeing the faults and sins in their spouse. You know, you always get people that come and tell you, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Well, my husband, you should see him. And they'll tell you everything wrong with their husband and nothing wrong with what they've done. And the other way around, the men can do it too. Everything wrong with their wife, but nothing wrong with what they've done. It's very easy to see the sins in others. They're as obvious as anything. And I don't doubt that they're all true. As I often tell people, you haven't married a saint. Stop expecting them to be a saint and being perfect. They're a human being with a fallen nature and they're flawed. Love them as they are. Love them and forgive them as Jesus does you. Because if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. It's fundamental. Yeah, I know it's not easy. And I know some people are rottenly betrayed by their loved ones. And maybe sometimes you do have to depart from them for your own salvation virtue, for your own survival. Yes, things can go very bad. But generally, it's something to remember. Look at yourself first. See what's wrong with you first. And be humble before God. The piercing of the spear 
gave life to everything that Christ gave us, what we call the sacraments. He changed baptism from a baptism of repentance to our new birth in him. All the sacraments that we go through as Catholics are given to us so that we can be united with Christ, so that we can benefit from his passion and death, but also so that we can grow in holiness and grace and be made ready for heaven. Everything he does is for us. And he asks us to trust him, to love him, to persevere to the end and to give witness to him, forgiving one another in utter love. I'm done. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation brought to you by Perusia Media. Perusia Media is an Australian-based media company bringing you good, wholesome Catholic formation material in DVD, CD, and book formats. Visit our website at www.perusiamedia.com. That's www.parousiamedia.com. Thank you for listening, and may God richly bless you and your family.